Are you a scoffer? Adam's in, like enthusiastically shaking his head. I think that's awesome. Sometimes, Barbie says, are you a I think we're all at various points in our, in our lives or in moments during the week, we're pretty good at being scoffers. Um, in fact, let's, um, let's take a, a second and make our best scoffing sound, right? Like you do maybe when you're in the line at Walmart and you're backed up and, you know, or maybe you're at the self-checkout at um, Pick and Save and someone's, like, you've got one item and someone else has, like, a hundred, like, you know, a, a month's worth of groceries and you're like, come on. Why couldn't you go through the, you know, like the line with the real checkout teller, right? Your scoffing sound. You ready? Let's do, you ready to do it? One, two, three. <sighs> right? Scoffing. Scoffing. We're good at scoffing. I kicked this off this series about um, the kingdom of God by pointing out that Jesus talks about kingdom. He uses the word kingdom, like way more than uses the word church. And another word that's caught my attention as I've been in my own personal devotional time, um, it started when you know, we were praying through the Psalms, and right there in Psalm 1 was this word scoffer. And it caught my attention. I started seeing how that word scoffer or scoffing turns up a lot of times in Scripture as well. Psalm 1 says, Blessed is the man or the woman... Who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight, her delight, is in the law of the Lord. And on his law, he, she meditates day and night. We do not want to be in the seat of the scoffers. We do not want to be amongst the scoffers. Scoffing is something that we need to eradicate from our lives. God's people are not scoffers. Um, but we're good at it, aren't we? To scoff. To scoff means to speak scornfully of someone. And I had to look up scorn. Like, what does scorn mean? Like, what does scornfully mean? So scorn is the belief that someone is despicable or worthless. So to scoff is essentially to make judgment about someone else. Making the judgment that they are in some way despicable or even worthless. Are you a scoffer? What we're going to see today is that while it, um, the conditions of the world um, may tempt us, um, while the conditions of the world may, in our eyes, justify um, scoffing and making judgment about others, this is not the time of judgment because this is not the time of the harvest. But this is the time of planting, the time of sowing, and therefore it is the time to lead people to the Lord with love, in truth and grace. Let's try to make that scoffing sound with love. Scoff, S-C-O-F-F. -F. Can we scoff with love? Ready? One, two, three. I heard an attempt, right? You can't really scoff with love. I was thinking about this. I have to give credit, Jody credit for this whole, the, the scoffing illustration. She was talking about it. I was like, that's brilliant. I'm going to use that. And as I thought about it, I was like, you know, the only thing that in my mind comes close is a southern thing. And that is when you say to someone, bless your heart. That's about as close as I think as you can get to scoffing with love. 
bless her heart. It's a very southern thing. On one side of the coin, it's bless them, bless you, it's love. But underneath, <laughs> it's really scoffing. <laughs> so it doesn't really count as love. We cannot scoff with love. The two just don't connect. They don't work. We can't do it. But we're tempted to. And in some ways, we might even think that we um, are justified in doing it. Let's walk through. Um, we're going to walk through the parable of the weeds, um, which is we're just picking up in Matthew, where we, basically where we left off last week, as we've been walking through this series um, as it is, um, looking at the kingdom of God and how God is establishing his kingdom, what that looks like. And Jesus tells all of these, these stories, these parables about the kingdom. And the kingdom is like this, and the kingdom you know, looks like this, and the kingdom is kind of like this situation. Jesus takes lots of time to unpack what the kingdom looks like. And so today, we're going to see that the kingdom is like a field, a farmer's field. Or in some ways, a field of battle. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 13. Um, we'll start at verse 24. And we'll read for a little bit, and then we're going to skip. So be ready for that. I'll tell you when we're going to skip. So, Matthew chapter 13, starting at verse 24. Jesus put another parable before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared also. And the servants of the master of the house came and said to him, Master, do, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have weeds? He said to them, an enemy has done this. So the servant said to him, Then how do you want us, then do you want us to go and gather them, the weeds? But he said, No, lest in gathering the weeds you root up the wheat along with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time, I will tell the reapers, Gather the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned. But gather the wheat into my barn. Now we're going to skip down to verse 36. Then he left the crowds and went into the house. And his disciples came to him saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. He answered, The one who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. And the good seed is the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels. They will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers. And throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. Very interesting parable, isn't it? Um, I've got my chart. We got a little chart. So we can like, you know, lay out. What exactly Jesus is talking about here? Um, I've been told that these have, have been very helpful, so we'll keep doing this. So this parable of the weeds, um, we're going to focus on a few things here. So we've got the field. Um, what does, now this is an interesting one, kind of like we had a couple weeks ago with the parable of the sower, where the disciples are asking Jesus, you know, they're basically saying, hey, we don't get it. <laughs> Unpack it for us. Explain it. Um, so Jesus gives an almost literal verbatim word, you know, person per person, place to place um, analogy and makes this connection. So we're very lucky in this way um, today. 
So in the parable, the field is what? Did we catch that? Field is the world. And the sower. Who's the sower? Adam's jumping ahead to the second part of the sermon. He's ready to go. Who's the sower in the story? Nope, not the angels. He literally says, the one who sows the good um, seed is the son of man. Son of man. That's an interesting phrase. Who's the son of man? Jesus. Very good. All right. And the good seed. What is the good seed? Or who is the good seed? Catch that? Verse 38. Sons of the kingdom. So we'll be um, gender inclusive. So we'll, we'll say, let's say children of the kingdom. Or we could say citizens, right? The citizens of God's kingdom. That's the good seed. And the enemy who snuck in in the middle of the night and sowed weeds in there. Who's the enemy, right? Satan, the devil. field is in some ways very much a field of battle it is a field of conflict between two kingdoms god's kingdom satan's kingdom kingdom of righteousness kingdom of of evil kingdom of light kingdom of darkness coming head to head and what we begin to see is some of the what's you know being taught here is People in, in where? In the world are either of the kingdom of God or of the kingdom of Satan. People in the world are either of the kingdom of light or of the kingdom of darkness. And how do we know the difference? How do we tell the difference? Ah, by the fruit. Very good, Curtis. By the fruit. What's interesting, I found this so fascinating this week as I was reading and studying um, about this passage, is, um, and I won't get too deep into all the technical stuff, but I find it fascinating um, that this word that's used for, wheat or for weeds in, in the Greek, it's only used here once in the whole Bible. It's one of those rare words that's only used once. And so there's all kinds of debate and, you know, kind of pondering about what, what does this word really mean? And one of the most popular theories that I found most fascinating is that this word for weed probably refers to a plant that is called bearded darnel. Bearded darnel. Now, this is a very interesting plant because this bearded darnel looks exactly like wheat. When it first starts to sprout up and grow, wheat and darnel look exactly the same. But as they grow and mature and get to the point where they start to produce their fruit or their grain, wheat obviously produces a head of grain, of wheat. The darnel produces um, this uh, black seed that hosts a fungus that is actually toxic to humans. So the darnel, in the process of sprouting and growing, looks just like the wheat. And it's not until the very end of its you know, growing season, when it begins to sprout its, its fruit or its grain, 
that it is then revealed as a weed that is not growing wheat, but is growing this nasty black seed that can actually be poison. Isn't that fascinating? And so it makes sense in the context when the servants are going to the, you know, to the owner of the, the field and saying, hey, do you want us to pull the weeds? And he's like, no, let them grow up together because they don't know which is which until the end, until the fruit is produced. So we only know who is children of the kingdom and who is children of Satan, who's children of the kingdom of light, or who's children of the kingdom of darkness by the fruit. By the fruit. Now, let's go on to you and us. So we got in the parable who's who and what's what. How about over here, for you and us, what's the field, do you think? Ah, the same, the world. Notice, it's the world, not the church. We're oftentimes quick to equate the field to the church. Jesus says, no, he says the field is the world world which kind of gets ties into what we've been saying kingdom and church are not always one and the same church the gathering the assembly of the people of god at its best is an expression or a reflection of the kingdom um, but not necessarily the same the field in this case is the world um, the sower who's sowing good seed. I guess we have to make that clear, right? The sower sows good seed. The enemy seeds, seeds sows weeds. It's like he sells seashore, seashells by the seashore. <laughs> so the sower who, who, who sows good seed, who is that? Adam? It's Adam. <laughs> it's us, right? We talked about this like two weeks in a row now, right? When it comes to this sewing business or extending the invitation, you know, back when it was the, the wedding banquet, sowing the seeds, that is, that is us. We are called to be the sowers, sowing the word, the seed of the kingdom of God. And, and who is the good seed then? Here, is it us? Yep, that's us, all right? Um, the enemy, still the same, right? Satan. And the weeds. Who's that? Is that us? Hopefully not, right? But think about this. At some point in life, weren't all of us weeds? If what makes the difference between weed and wheat is fruit, the grain that's produced, and other than that, they look exactly the same, weren't we all at one point weeds? But I get Part of what I get out of this parable is, you know, the first reaction on the part of the servants is, hey, you know, we got to do something about this weed situation. Let's start pulling these weeds out of here. And the owner says, no, let it all grow up together. And at the end, when the fruit is born, then we'll know which is which, and we'll harvest it all. We'll separate it out. What that tells me is that it's not until the fruit is born that we know which is which. So as I look at my own life or I look at the life 
cycle of a Christian, what I see is that there's a point in time at which everyone is weed. In the kingdom, everyone's welcome. Nobody's perfect. And anything's possible. Everyone's welcome. We saw this two weeks ago with the invitation, the wedding banquet. Bring them all in. Good and bad, the king said. Bring them all in. Good and bad. And we see here this picture of the field in which and wheat are growing up and are left to grow up in the same place at the same time. Everybody's welcome. Nobody's perfect. Nobody's perfect. Some are wheat because they're bearing fruits of righteousness, fruits of the Spirit. They're producing literal fruit, other disciples, other followers of Jesus. And some are bearing fruits of darkness, fruits of evil, fruits of unholiness, fruits of sin. But wasn't that all of us at one point? All of us at some point for fruits of darkness, sin, unholiness. And it's only by the grace of God, the love of God, it's only by a relationship with God made possible by Jesus' sacrifice of himself, his death on the cross and his resurrection, his victory over sin and death and our entrance into this relationship with God that Jesus made possible, it's only through that that we experience new life, right? It's only through that that we experience this radical transformation from child of darkness, child of light, from child of Satan to child of God. And so it seems to me that all of us at one point in our life were weeds. And I would make the assumption that if we're gathered in worship, sitting in this room this morning, singing praises and praying prayers to God Almighty, that at some point in our life we experienced that relationship with God. We experienced that outpouring of the Holy Spirit that has transformed us and changed us and claimed us as children of the kingdom, as children of God. And so we have experienced this radical transformation. We are no longer weeds, but we are wheat. And now hopefully bearing good fruit, fruits of righteousness, fruits of the Spirit, lives that reflect the life of Jesus. Lives in which and through which um, we reveal the living God, through which we reveal God's glory as we live in, into and live out Christ-like faith, Christ-like love, Christ-like hope, Christ-like power. Everybody at one point was weak. And it's not until the fruit is born that we know which is which. And so, let it all grow up together, the owner says. Who's the owner? It's God. Just let it all grow up together. And at the end, we'll take care of it. And who's going to take care of it? God and his angels, right? Judgment, scoffing, not our job, not our place. Because who are we? We're the sowers. Our job is to sow the seeds of the kingdom to continually, like we saw last week with this, the parable of the sower, to just graciously, um, generously, with great abundance and abandon, just sow the seed of the word of the kingdom of God and leave the harvest up to the Lord and his angels. Judgment's not our job. It's not our place. We're the sowers. So we sow and we sow and we sow. Because we don't know who's weed 
and whose wheat always. And it seems to me that I've experienced this in my own life. At any point, anyone can repent, accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, and experience the fullness of life that God has for them. At any point, anyone along the line can experience the radical transformation that God and the Holy Spirit makes possible transforming them from weed into wheat. And so our job is just to sow the seeds, to sow the seeds of the kingdom of God everywhere, everywhere we go with everyone who we meet, and to withhold our judgment because we don't know we don't know what God is going to do in a person's life. We're tempted to scoff, which really is, uh, the theory is, this is probably why Jesus told the parable to begin with. Because the disciples, and definitely the Pharisees and the scribes, the religious people of Jesus' day, would have been saying, you know, Jesus, look at the world. Look at how messed up it is. Look at all of these, you know, works of darkness. Look at all these people who have fallen short. They're not keeping all the, what is it, 240-something laws that were in place at the time in the, you know, amongst the Jewish people. They're not following all of that perfectly. We got all these sinful people in our midst. Aren't you going to do something about it? Aren't you going to pull these weeds and get rid of them? So that we, as God's chosen people, can be cleansed and purified and not have to deal with all of these imperfect people who are unholy, sinful. And the story that Jesus tells is this story. No, let it all grow up together. We don't always know what's weed and what's wheat. With God, anything is possible. We don't know how our sowing of the seed of God's word, of God's love, God's grace, how that is going to transform someone's heart, how Holy Spirit is going to work in their hearts and in their lives and bring about this radical transformation. So leave the judgment to God at the end of the age. And in this season of sowing and planting, spread the seed, spread the word, plant that seed everywhere you go with everyone you meet. Withhold your judgment and share the seed of God's word, um, God's unconditional love and amazing grace through word and deed. That's not to ignore, right, that there's an end time coming. The parable is very clear about that. There is an end time coming, and there will be a judgment, and everyone will stand before God and his angels and be judged. That's going to happen. But the judgment is God's job. It's not ours. Our job is to withhold our judgment. To rein in our scoffing to share God's love, God's grace. Like I said, yeah, we might be somewhat justified and, you know, look at how terrible the world is. Look at how bad people are. Judgment's not our place. How effective is it to lead someone into a relationship with God by heaping judgment, condemnation upon them? By telling them, what it's scoffing, right, is to treat people scornfully as if they are despicable, even worthless. How effective is that? Leading someone into a relationship with God. To continually heap upon them condemnation, pointing out how despicable, how worthless 
they are. How effective is that? I'm reading this book about um, Abraham Lincoln. Fascinating book. And in there, it talks about how um, you know, Abraham Lincoln was one who he stood for, obviously, abolition and end to slavery. Um, he was also one who stood for temperance. Um, it was always part of his um, political what, platform to stand for temperance, getting, a, getting rid of alcohol. But Lincoln talked about how you know, he raised the same question. You know, we tend to go about trying to convince people that they should give up alcohol and not drink anymore and embrace sobriety by heaping upon them all kinds of ridicule and condemnation by pointing out how awful and terrible they are, how much, you know, you're just a bunch of drunkards. And he talked about how effective is that? It's really not effective at all. So we lead people into a life of sobriety, a life of embracing um, what life can be like without alcohol by loving them into it, by leading with love and grace. I was like, man, isn't that the same thing here? We who've experienced this radical transformation, we who are now the religious people of our day, we see, yes, how evil the world can be, how far short people can fall in their, in their walk with God, or how completely deluded they may be in their perception of what is right and wrong, or their, what, in complete and entire rejection of any system of what's right and wrong. We can look at that and scoff, point out how worthless they are, how off point they are, but how effective is that in leading them into this life of transformation? Call and the reminder is that this is not the harvest time. This is not the time of harvest. It is not the time of the judgment. This is planting season. This is the time of sowing the seed of the kingdom of God. This is the time for us who have experienced the radical transformation from weed to wheat to be the sowers of this word, this gospel, and to sow that withholding judgment and sharing God's unconditional love, grace, word, and peace. I encourage you, what next step will you take this week? I will sow the seed of the kingdom of God through word and deed, which was an option last week. It's still an option this week. Let's sow the seed of the kingdom of God through word and deed. And let's take the next step. As I sow, I will withhold judgment. I will withhold judgment and share God's unconditional love and amazing grace. Let's stand together. Almighty God, we give you thanks and praise for the amazing grace that you have shown to us through the life, death, and resurrection of your son, Jesus. You so love the world that you gave your only son. All who believe in him may not die, may not perish, but may have eternal life. For Jesus, your son, came into the world not to condemn the world, but to save it. We, your people, who've experienced the radical transformation, the radical love and grace that you have shown to all people, may we be so filled with your spirit and enabled and empowered as we go forth into the world this week to share that love and that grace with everyone who we meet, sowing the seed of the word of your kingdom with everyone withholding our judgment, putting a lid on our desire to scoff, to count others as worthless or less than, to love them. You have loved us. Pray for them.
You have commanded us in your scripture to pray for our enemies. Work in and through us, Lord. Feel your glory. Extend your kingdom. And go into the world, right? It's our mission to live like Jesus, reveal the living God. Have a fantastic week, um, and we'll see you next Sunday.